Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky uh, here with you today, and I'm very excited to have Dr. Nadia Jiksimbaeva joining us. Nadia, welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for helping me to pronounce your, your name correctly, because uh, that was certainly a challenge, but I, I got the thumbs up. So let's dive in, Nadia. Um, you're the founder and chief reinvention officer uh, of the Reinvention Academy, where you help companies turn disruption into opportunity. Uh, your clients include well-known brands like Coca-Cola, IBM, Cisco, and many others. You're an author, an educator, a keynote speaker, and Ventures Magazine, uh, which I haven't heard of before, but uh, they call you the queen of reinvention. So let's, let's dive into that because I really want to better understand how you got to where you are and hopefully through your journey and lessons learned, uh, everyone that's tuning in with us right now can also benefit from that. So why don't we start off you know, the term chief reinvention officer, where did that come from? Oh, that's such a good story. And it's also a story of another consultant. So um, just to back up a little bit, I am a recovering academic. Like a recovering alcoholic, you never quite recover. You always have relapses and you do research and you teach and you write. And when I was still a full-time uh, Coca-Cola chaired professor. I taught strategy, leadership, and sustainability. And I got this big honor. Chaired professorship means pretty much the highest honor I could possibly get in academia. Uh, one of my students dared me. He was an exec ed student and he was a CEO of a company. And he said, you speak so nicely. I almost believe you, but you never worked in business. You have absolutely no business experience. You're just a business teacher. What do you know? So how about you come do some real work and then I will see if what you say actually plays out in real life. So we started a consulting business on a dare and he was our first client. And 2007 was the launch of the uh, reinvention um, consultancy. And by 2014, we couldn't accept any more clients. We became very clearly focused on figuring out how to teach people how to fish rather than fish for them. Mm -hmm. That was the move from pure consulting to a kind of blended consulting education. And we hired an amazing positioning consultant called Mark Levy. You probably know his greatest client is Simon Sinek. Uh, he was also a business practitioner looking for an intellectual framework, how to speak of his thinking. And Mark is a very tough person. He kept pushing me and pushing me on calls like this. And one time he said, okay, if your job that what you do in companies would have a title, what would be the title? And I said, well, it's not chief strategy officer because it lacks implementation. It's not chief transformation officer because it's kind of doesn't have this uplift. It's not this and that, and I kept, calling different names. And then I said, I think it's chief reinvention officer. That's probably the closest I could call it. And he was silent for a while. And then he Googled something and he said, the URL is not taken by it right now. And that's where that title comes from. Uh, before we dive deeper than into your story, I, I actually want to go back. Just I'm interested uh, because you, you mentioned you're originally from Kazakhstan. Yes. So can you walk us through when did you come to, to the US? What did that journey look like for you? Yeah, um, all of my journey is a story of amazing people who bolstered me and pushed me and gave me amazing opportunities. So I was born in the Soviet Union. In 91, Soviet Union collapsed without any warning. And Kazakhstan was so unprepared that it took us almost three years to develop our own currency. We had no specialists and no national bank to know what it means to have your own currency or whole, what it looks like to have a treasury at the government level. So I had a huge luxury. I was part of a youth organization that brought me first in the US in 95 and 96 as a youth consultant to California Association of Student Councils. That's where I got introduced to leadership. And I came back first for my graduate school and then for my PhD in uh, organizational behavior at Case Western Reserve University. So every step of the way, somebody literally said, you must do this, right. I am pushing you. And in terms of my doctorate, for example, I was very cocky, young 
22 year old and I was like, I'm going to New York City, I'm going to be on Wall Street. And my, uh, my professors uh, crowdfunded money to buy a ticket for me to go to the interview for a doctorate program and said, you will say no when they say no. Now you go. And they gave me a ticket and I'm very, very thankful. We're still in touch with all of my college. Why, why did they do that? I mean, like, first of all, why did you even have the opportunity to, to come to the US? Because I'm sure there is likely many uh, you know, young kids that, that wanted an opportunity like that, but, but didn't receive it. What, was, what do you think was special about you that, that allowed you to, to have that opportunity? Uh, on one end, it's the opportunity that was given to me. So I came always on scholarships. I'm a recipient of Freedom Support Act scholarship, which is a very competitive program that usually selects one person per million of population from a country that needs support. And every time I had somebody who pushed me. But also, I come from an amazing family. We are a family of descendants of um, political prisoners of every kind. The last one was my grandfather who killed himself in 75 after being tortured in prison. And many people before were executed for political activism. And I think it's my parents who really pushed education and thinking, open-mindedness, and so many other things. So it's a combination of opportunity meeting preparedness. On one end is being super prepared and you know studying English and so on. On another end is um, just the grace of so many mentors that truly cared uh, yeah. when I was so young and so kind of inexperienced and cocky and all of that. Do you play sports? No. Okay. I mean, no. the I asked because for me, um, when I was young and I also, I grew up, uh, well, I was born in Toronto. I lived in Israel from the ages of two to about six and a half, then came back to Canada. I didn't speak English. Uh, I felt like an outsider. My way of, of really like academics, I was, I was terrible at, but sports, that's where I excelled. And, and I find that that mindset of, you know, really pushing yourself and, uh, mm -hmm. always trying to be at the top of your game. I see that a lot with people who play sports. That's why I was wondering if, if that was your background, but it, what, what was channeling that for you? I mean, was it the, your family, the past experiences? Like where, where do you think you got that, that drive from? Well, um, part of it was the circumstance. Everything was collapsing around you and you kind of have a choice to make at that point. Uh, can you imagine one day you wake up and there is no government anymore, no police, no ministers, no anything. And nobody knows when they will show up. And uh, I started working at that point because we needed money. My first job was at 13. I was selling life insurance. I still remember learning the word uh, leasing uh, just because in the Soviet Union, there was no private economy. So we never okay. used economic terms. So part of it was just the necessity that either you choose to die or you choose to live. And that's a choice um, I made and my family made. I did dance. I danced professionally in the Kazakh president's troupe for six out of nine years that I danced. And yeah. that's just, um, you know, if you can imagine a Soviet ballet school that looks like an army and maybe scarier than the army. I love my dance teacher to death. And I quit the first moment I could quit because it's unbearable amount of discipline. But I think that was also just the sheer grit you just show up and you dance every single day and then you perform on the weekend. And that that's part of a journey that I think did the, what sports did for you. Okay. So thank you for sharing that. Now I have a little more background in, into you and kind of where you've, you've come from. Uh, let's fast forward to what's been happening in the world more recently. Uh, so COVID right um, from February, March of 2020, uh, for a lot of people in the world, right, really started to to have um, an impact in a in a very challenging way. You are the queen of reinvention, right? As the magazine called you, uh, did you have to reinvent anything in, in how you operate as a consultant, as an advisor, uh, in running your business? Any reinvention that happened, and and if so, what did that look like? A lot of reinvention happened, but I have to tell you, uh, the start of my year was very different from what you can imagine. So we have two big arms of our business. We have a traditional, very high-end consulting. So we are working in partnership with McKinsey and Deloitte and Boston Consulting Group, and we are competitive in prices with them. So we are very comfortable in our consulting niche. 
And then we have education where we do uh, virtual courses, mostly sometimes face-to-face -face education. And our educational branch was struggling because we were selling uh, reinvention, which is very preventative. It's very a uh, proactive approach to disruption. And everyone would say, it's unnecessary. Look, the economy is great. There is no disruption. What in the heck are you talking about? So in February, exactly one year ago, right before COVID started really freezing the Western world, we had a big, big course launch happening. And we lost so much money on that launch uh, because the investment didn't pay off in terms of all the ads we were running. We had a good course had a good number of students, but it didn't recoup. There, there was no return on investment. We were actually in the minus. So in February, I was this pretty sad person because I'm like, okay, the consulting business is great, but the education, we're doing something wrong. I need to rethink what's going on. March 2020, exactly one month later, we went into overdrive with requests. We did a lot of pro bono uh, events because people were just really losing their livelihood and everything. And then by May, we already had paid programs and we were just calculating this number. So um, I, will, uh, I will ask for uh, permission just to check very, very quickly, but I think we are at around 500 growth in our business in one year. Uh, because growth. Uh, 500 percent 400 something so okay. I want to find where that number is but we're just about 500 400 480 something percent right. growth so that's, so so that's we the started with a huge of, loss of the business of a business yeah we started with a huge loss and we end up with a huge gain specifically right. because our specialty is how do you deal with disruption in a moment and how do you prepare for the next one and if before 2020, nobody could believe us that disruptions will come again and again. Mm -hmm. I think now everyone is in this, of course, it's obvious it's not going to be the new normal. It's going to be constant evolution and constant disruption. So we need to learn how to live in it. And this was a turnout for us, turnaround. So we had to reinvent. We had to grow the team. We had to put out tons of new products we've never done. We had to speak in two languages. Suddenly, we had to go to a few markets and learn how to speak a few languages, translate our products in different languages. So that was an interesting journey. But if you were to ask me a year ago, I would be in tears and saying, I'm a failure. I don't know what I'm doing and so on. It's amazing how things can change so quickly, right? Like when you're in that moment, pain or just fear, it, it can almost paralyze you. Uh, but if you keep going the next day or the next week or the next month, things could be completely different. I think that's a, that's a really good example of that. Um, talk to me a little bit about the future, right? So, so you spend a lot of time working with your clients, thinking about how to prepare for a potential disruption, how to reinvent themselves. When you look at especially the landscape for professional services, uh, providing advice, coaching, consulting, uh, even education to the marketplace, is there anything that you see right now that if, if you were looking you know, into 2020 or 2023 or 2024 that you think will be much more common then in comparison to now? Just a little bit of kind of tell me the future of what you see. I'll speak specifically for consulting industry trends. Please. And Good news is that uh, in the last year, I actually did massive number of interviews of owners of other consulting businesses that are across different spaces. So marketing consulting, IT consulting, super niche consulting, and also general management consulting. So we actually prepared a big report on the key trends to understand what's happening, not only in this year, but thinking about the next five years or so. So 2020, uh, the data shows that US alone, consulting industry contracted almost 8%, the largest contraction in the revenue by far in many, many years. At the same time, the big powerhouses, even the big ones are still growing. Deloitte posted almost 6% growth. And as I said, the medium-sized or boutique consultancies, we would be in the boutique consultancy category. Uh, we are growing uh, times, not percentage. We are almost five times growth. So uh, the news for you is that things are bad and things are great. And it uh, is very, very important that you understand what is working and what is not working. So this is what we discovered. Trend number one is that if in the past, most of consulting was about specific subject matter expertise. 
So you know the answer and you can deliver that expertise. It can be very complex answer, not just 10 steps. It can be 500 steps, but it is a clear answer. It is a uh, something, it could be proprietary knowledge, it could be past experience, it could be your unique expertise, but there is an answer. If before we were expert matter, <laughs> people's of uh, expertise in a particular matter, now it's much more about process. I don't know the answer, but I know how to find the answer and I know how to organize very quickly and test and prototype and get feedback and get to the answer. So there's a shift from content to process consulting. Mm -hmm. Number two is that we are seeing a very significant relationship to how we get paid. So we are seeing many more companies open to more creative partnerships in consulting, including uh, uh, result fees. So you have a small fixed and a more bet on result. We are seeing more of a blended variable and fixed. We are seeing insourcing and outsourcing of whole executive positions. We're seeing much more creativity in what it looks like to have a contract. And then finally, what is a big trend is collaborations. If before we would be considered uh, competitors to many, we actually do massive projects with many, many consulting companies, big and small, because it allows us to be much more reflective of the emergent and uncertain challenge that we will face once we enter the situation. And instead of holding fixed um, content expertise in our own team, right, having tons of employees who know different pieces, it's easier to partner and everyone share the expertise. So this would be the three trends that I would speak about. What are we consulting? or what is the offer, how we get paid and who are we doing it with. Talk to me a little bit more about the uh, the partnership side. Cause you know, you mentioned that McKinsey, Deloitte, these other large consulting firms, while you know, could be viewed as competitors to a degree, you're actually partnering with uh, organizations like these. Mm -hmm. so what does that look like in a little bit more detail? Why, sure. why are you partnering with that type of, of organization? And then how are you actually using that to, to build your business? Sure. Uh, reinvention is an umbrella framework that aims to connect disconnected, often silenced um, functional areas. So in a business, strategists usually don't like operations people and operations people don't like sales and strategists. Then there are people people. This is organizational development, communications, HR. They don't like money or numbers. And all of these people represent very different schools of thought. There is a theory of strategy. There is forecasting. There is innovation. There is uh, design thinking. There's Scrum Agile. There is organizational development. There is leadership. And all of them are misaligned and they do not have a, a, a kind of essential focus on value creation. Everyone is focused on whatever their personal preference is. So we most often, how we started collaborating with big houses was not our choice, it was the client choice. So the client would hire the big name for the calculations, forecast, business modeling. But when it comes to getting it done, they would say, hey, they're detached from reality. Sometimes what they propose, you come on the ground, it's undo, like it cannot be implemented. It's just a nice PowerPoint. We need to make sure in the process, you serve as a bridge between the real business and the kind of theoretical frameworking that the big houses usually do. In the past, that was the start. After a while, we actually started liking each other. So I was asked, for example, by Boston Consulting Group, by some of their partners to come back and teach their mid-level principals and consultants and junior consultants some of the things around the change management, around prototyping, around design thinking, around more of this um, nitty-gritty messy part of business growth and transformation and pivoting that is not just something you can do in Excel and put it into a nice PowerPoint. So that's how it started for us. Now we're doing very different things. We are doing blended programs. We are doing, um, uh, the, the, this year, we are testing a lot, a kind of Tesla for consulting, when we are thinking about creating a platform for consulting where we connect customers 
and potential providers and we keep a percentage of the uh, of the revenue of the contract so we have a couple of tests running right now so right. now we are going into crazy ideas right, on right, what right. collaboration looks like so I'd love to explore a little bit more about the this idea. So you, you are working with a client. The mm -hmm. client is also working with a large consulting firm. And I, we hear this a lot from, from our clients in our coaching program that, um, you know, they'll often win business or go into working with, with a company because they, they've brought in maybe one of those larger consulting uh, houses. But exactly like you said, it's it's too high level or, you know, it, it's great on the strategic kind of vision, but the implementation doesn't happen. There's there's always uh, kind of a, um, uh, a failure in being able to take what the you know, those great ideas and and turn them into reality. So that that part makes sense. But what would your advice be, or, or how do you think about, or what are some best practices for navigating that relationship between you being brought in as kind of the you know the small guys into an environment where there you have the client, but then you also have this much larger organization like a McKinsey or, or a BCG or whoever it might be, any best practices or tips that you found to be helpful in navigating that relationship so that ultimately you can still deliver great value to the client, but you're not, you know, kind of stepping on each other's toes uh, or, or having uh, potential, you know, confrontations on, on different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Well, I think part of it is internal work on the mindset shift and part of it is uh, external things around um, just very open discussion on starting assumptions and perimeters and so on. The mindset part is stop thinking of yourself as small. Right now, today, because of the speed of change, we have study after study that shows the past success, the best practice of yesterday, not only can be unuseful today, it can be dangerous. And what those big houses rely on, they rely on past successes. I had a very cynical conversation with one of very senior partners, I won't name the company, but I remember they said, um, it was a conversation in London, so one of their main offices, and the partner said that uh, after a meeting with a client, if we enter the taxi and we don't know which template we're gonna use from the past, we don't accept the client. This is the actual quote. So the big houses, and I admire the effort they do. They do a lot of new intellectual work. They are trying to reinvent and you can read their work and respect their work. And you also need to understand what are their strengths and the, what are their weaknesses. Their weaknesses today is unfortunately is reliance, over-reliance on past success. And you have a unique capability to be free from a lot of weight of past success and the brand limitations and a lot of inflexibility that comes with that. So um, I work with my husband, who is also CEO of, a customer, of our company, and he keeps telling me, Nadia, we are only as good as our last score. He, he loves football and it was Super Bowl yesterday. So we're only as good as last score. So it's a great equalization right now. We are all equalized. Uh, big name, small name, we're only as good as our last score. So first and foremost, the mindset should be very clear that there's no better or worse right now. You're only as good as what you can deliver right now. So go ahead and deliver. And that will be louder. Your reputation will be louder than anything you can imagine. Yeah. Then there's, a, of course, a technicalities, which is entering into a conversation. There has to be very clear discussion on the scopes, on the responsibility, on the way of cooperating, and also very clear discussion on how we work. So we actually write a memorandum, and it includes things like, we are very, very kind and gentle to the people and we are ruthless to ideas and decisions. So if you get something from us, know that we are speaking about the ideas and decisions and we love you dearly and don't take it personal, but we will write a common memo that in a very plain language explains when you see this kind of email or text mm -hmm. or whatever from me, this is how to interpret it. It's not an attack. It's I'm just being very ruthless to ideas the way I would be ruthless to my ideas. But you as a person is never, never under attack. And, and who do you send that to? Does it go to the client and let's say to the partner or is it only to the client or who, who sees it? Uh, it depends on who is involved in the process. So sometimes 
if it's a long-term client relationship and I know the client for many years, uh, whether it's a board, the whole board or particular one sponsor, if we have a very long-standing relationship, I don't need to renegotiate anything with them. It is a negotiations and it's a document co-created together with a new partner. If it's a whole new situation, then we actually do workshops at the beginning to align. It can be virtual or physical at this point, virtual, but we actually have a workshop to align and make sure that this is very, very transparent and that we speak about it from the beginning. Hey, this is going to happen. It's like a new relationship. We don't know each other. <laughs> we need to figure out who is uh, sleeping on which side of the bed and how the pillows are preferred and blah, blah, all this stuff. And we try to make it humorous and relaxed and so on and not walk around that issue. Be very open that this will happen. This is normal. And this is the way we plan to solve it as we go along. I think that's so important because so often communication is what breaks down relationships uh, and people go, often think, oh, I, I wish I would have said that or mm -hmm. it's too late now. And so just getting it out kind of all in the open in mm -hmm. a way where you're showing kindness, I think is, is really powerful. The other thing that really resonated as you're sharing this, Nadia, is the idea of kind of like the David and Goliath that a lot of smaller boutique or just, you know, independent solo consultants or, or small firms look at the big companies and go, yeah, but I can't compete with them and so on and so on. What you're saying is, uh, you know, think differently. It's look at what you can do now, right? Don't just compare yourself to this bigger organization. How would you suggest though, how would you advise someone to communicate that? So yes, you know, you can look at your score and, and not the whole past, but how, how would someone actually turn that into reality? What would be the kind of the, the tactical implementation of that in terms of them being able to communicate more effectively that, yeah, like I actually have some great ideas. I can help you to solve this problem. Is it in their messaging? Is it in content? Do they need to write a book? H how would you suggest that if I'm saying, okay, I have great ideas. I help lots of people. I know I can help, you know, these other group of, of organizations, but right now they're probably getting contacted by some of the large consulting firms or much larger than my consulting firm. What would you advise, you know, me as the consultant to do to go in and get in front of them? And I'm just talking hypothetically here, but what, what might that look like? Well, um, I can only share what worked for us. And by the way, uh, if anybody knew this answer like this, <laughs> I want to talk to that person as well, because it's been a long and interesting journey. And it's also a personal journey, right? So you need to figure out what's authentic to your voice, because nothing inauthentic will work. Yeah. What is authentic to your style of working? I just discovered I hate... Um, uh, prepared recordings. If you make me laugh, I have no problems, but prepared recordings, I just avoid them. I drag them. I drive my team crazy, rescheduling them and so on. So you need to know what your nervous system prefers, what Definitely. you prefer and so on. Yeah. In my case, I think there's two very different stories. One story is a long-term story and one story is a short-term immediate. What do you do in the moment of pitch. So the long-term story should be there. And the thing is, very few stick at it, very few. This idea of showing up, what you are doing with your content, with the, producing the podcast, it doesn't need to be podcast. It can be blog, it can be YouTube videos, it can be Facebook Lives, it can, but they have to be consistent and you have to stick at it. Yeah. The, the key to that is really about long-term and consistent content that allows you to, to demonstrate your value to the ideal client, to the marketplace. Yes. Okay. And as you know yourself, staying, sticking with it, even when at the beginning there is no significant response and you're like, what the heck am I doing and spending all this time? This is why so few remain because sticking with it and delivering week after week is part of your brand. It's part of your credibility and trust because would you stick through a three months, four months, five years transformation process that is required for, or even five months, six months, extremely challenging transformation, or will you just say, nah, this is not for me? This is what clients are testing, how resilient you are, how much grit you have, how much consistency, and also how, what's your thinking, right? What's the content that you produce? If you don't like consistent content in the form of blogs, weekly uh, podcast, or more of this kind of intense investment, there is, of course, a route of books. Uh, there is a route of 
keynotes and so on. We've done all of it. And it's important to understand it doesn't come overnight. Uh, this year, just this year, we've been featured in Harvard Business Review, Wired, the Wall Street Journal, and I don't remember what else. Like um, things I would wish five years that we were showing up. Do you think that made a significant difference? It was sweet. Uh, yes, more people know about us, but did we suddenly just overnight became a success? No, it's just, yeah. yeah, this is nice. Another thing confirmed that we're doing something right, but nothing magically will change in your life. So this grid becomes very, very important. The second thing is what happens immediately once you have a chance to have a coffee, once you have a chance uh, to have a, any kind of conversation, which is do not try to push any kind of content at that point. Just listen, just shut up and listen. The most important thing that happens in the early conversations is figuring out what is the pain of your client and really deeply figuring out their mode of thinking, what's important to them, what's not important to them. What are the rules of the game in this company? Not just intellectual game, but political game, emotional game, culture. If you don't fit all of that and your proposal goes straight against the culture of your company, you all know the famous Peter Drucker quote that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Anything you propose intellectually viable will be eaten by culture if you didn't pick up on some of these clues. So this is very important to first figure out, listen to the client. And that's what I would advise. So how would I combine both? This is what I do all the time and I really advise it. Uh, ask your potential clients for an interview for an industry report and actually produce a report that you can do it in a PDF and no real cost of any kind. But interview five, six, 10, 25 potential customers, figure out an interesting piece of content, get the, and that allows you to both get the client, get a great piece of content, send it back to them and then pitch something. Then you have a foot in the door and you didn't start with selling. You started with listening. You started with value. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a really great strategy and you can apply it to, to podcasts or interviews for a book or all different kinds of things. But really what, what, uh, where I see the value in that is that it allows you to build a relationship mm -hmm. with someone that you want to have a relationship for the long term. Um, and in many cases, right, that can turn into business. But even if it doesn't, they at least now know who you are, right? Know what you do, and you can continue to kind of nurture that relationship going forward. So I think that's that's really good advice. Nadia, I want to make sure that people can learn more about you, the work that you're doing, the content that you're putting out. Uh, where's the best place for them to go? The best place to go is learn to reinvent.com. The two is a number. Uh, I don't know why we did that, but that's the best URL we could find. Learn to reinvent.com. You will get all kinds of opportunities there, which is um, starting with the 85-page free download of our news book, the Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook, which I'm very happy to put out because 3,000 extra more than 3,000 people put together some tools and participate in writing that book. So learn to reinvent.com and we have some cool stuff coming up. Uh, so you're welcome to land on the page, find new events, uh, get some free freebies and see if we are a good fit for you. Wonderful. Nadia, thanks so much. I really appreciate the conversation today. Thank you for having me.